shipped in that's that's the savings uh, we're also let me get my notes <laughs> okay and the cost is definitely a savings because you can make good wine for once you if you own the equipment you can make good wine for three dollars a bottle um, if you want to go down to California and grape juice like I did last year you can make it for a dollar uh, and that's a whole lot cheaper than what you can buy at the store. The other thing that's really good and a good reason for making wine is you can adjust it to your own taste. Okay? Uh, the wife and I, neither one of us particularly care for uh, heavy oak wines. We like red wines, but we don't like a heavy oak flavor. Uh, the, most of the commercial wines that you buy nowadays are oak flavored pretty strong. You can do it oak flavored by aging it on oak chips, okay? And you can add the oak flavor if you like. If you don't like it, you can leave them out. So, I mean, you don't, you don't have to add that. Either oak chips or spirals. And then drop these right down in the carboy when it's, uh, when it's sitting and aging. And you can leave it up to six months in the carboy and, and let it get just as oaky as you want. The other thing is sweetness. Uh, when you make wine, the best way to do it is to ferment it all the way down. Uh, actually, it's below below one. One is where the water would be. And the reason why it's below is because the alcohol is less than less than one water. And it's lighter, and so that that's that's why it's dropping. What you're measuring is you're measuring the specific gravity. And this is the little instrument that we use. You measure the specific gravity and you put this in the bucket with the juice and then you read the scale and it tells you what the alcohol content is. Uh, when you start off, how high the sugars are. And then as it ferments, it'll drop all the way down. Here's zero and it'll drop below zero. And that's a very, very dry wine. Okay? Uh, that's what I prefer. A lot of people do prefer sweet, sweeter wines, and you can do that by either taking grape juice and adding sugar and a couple of chemicals, or you can simply buy a wine conditioner and add this back into the wine just before you bottle. Another little trick on the oak flavor Instead of doing that, if you if you get a bottle of wine and if you like the oak flavor a lot, take a take an eyedropper and take just a drop of uh, vanilla extract and put it in a bottle. It'll have an oak flavor. They can't do that commercially, but you can as a wine you know 
person. What I do is I teach uh, down at the store on a one-on-one, -on -one, not, a, not a classroom situation. I did used to do that, and that's how Steve and I got along. We used to do it over here. Uh, but when the economy went south, we, uh, we couldn't afford, you know, we couldn't get the classes because it was $300 to take the class, and that included all your equipment and everything. Uh, people didn't want to spend that much money. The kit that I carry, that I use, and I stand behind and, and really believe in, sells for about $105, $110 a kit. Makes 30 bottles of wine. If you buy one of these and you we set up a time, you can rent me and my equipment for 25 bucks. No. And we make it right in the store. You use my equipment. That way you can make 30 bottles of wine. You find out if you like to do it. It ends up costing you about $150 by the time you buy the forks and kit and you pay the $25 fee. So it's about $150 and you make 30 bottles of wine. Which makes a great gift because we recycle the bottles, use your own, you put your own label on it so it comes from you and it makes an absolutely great gift. That's what a lot of people have made it for. <coughs> it takes, by the way, it takes five weeks to make this kit. Uh, I'm going to show you basically what's in the kit. The kit that I use has a great pack, which is actually the skins and, and the crushed grapes, which is the same way they ferment in the, uh, at the wineries. A lot of cheaper kits don't have that. They just have the juice. And that adds a lot of body to the wine, adds more flavor, makes a good wine. Uh, the other thing is it adds, they've got oak sawdust that you can add. They've got the sock that you put the juice in, they've got the yeast, and they've got all the chemicals that you need to make, to make the wine right in there. And then you've got the juice. This is a concentrate. You put it through here, pour it into, you start out pouring it into a primary fermenter. You leave it in here for uh, a week to 10 days. And this is the only time it's really critical. A week to 10 days, once the, your hydrometer has dropped down close to zero, then it's time to go from there into the carboy. Uh, you want it in here to start with because yeast takes oxygen in order to work. And so this you use with just a loose fitting lid on it, keep the bugs out of it and that kind of thing, but you, you want the oxygen to work on the yeast and that's, that's what, what, the way it makes alcohol is changing the sugar, the yeast changes the sugar into alcohol. So that's what happens the first week. At that point, it's not real good to drink. You can taste it. And it's definitely wine, but it's, uh, it's a little harsh. Uh, aging will help that. Clearing it, clarifying it helps. And that's what you do with the, the rest of the time. So then you go from here into the carboy. And you fill it up until you get within an inch or two of the of your cork. Okay? And the reason why is because you want at this point you want no oxygen. And that's the same as you'd have in a wine bottle. Uh, you don't want any oxygen getting to it because that's what can spoil it. And that's the same thing. If you leave a bottle of wine without a cork on it, you know, leave it sitting on the counter, a day or two it's gone. So this is an airlock that we use. We fill this up halfway with sanitizing solution. And then the gases can escape, come out, and no bugs can get in, and no oxygen can get down into the wine. So this works very good. You can, once you get to go through all the steps in the kit, you could leave it in here for 
six months. I had a gal that just made wine down there. And her father had a medical emergency and she had to go back to Arkansas. So she took off and I kept the bottle, kept it down there. It was about two months since she came back and that tasted fine. It was great. Matter of fact, it had aged a little bit since. And it will age uh, and continue to get better from, we normally bottle it like five weeks uh, and then it'll age for about the next six months and continue to get better. So that's one thing. You definitely, the first couple of weeks, it will still taste a little harsh because it has bottle shock from being bottled. But then after that, it calmed down and, and uh, starts getting better and better all the time. Okay, so that's the kit. When you say bottle shock, bottle shock, what do you mean by that? Bottle shock is when you go, when you bottle it, you're, you're going from here into the end of the bottle. I'm going to show you the equipment here that we use. And by doing that, you, you disturb the wine. You, you exposed it to the oxygen, which is, hasn't been. So then it takes a while to settle back down here. And that's what bottle shock is. Okay. The equipment that I use is a hydrometer, which I explained to you. You use this to check and see how far it's from in it. Okay. A stir stick, because when, once we've got the, the grape pack in there, you want to stir it every day while it's fermenting to uh, uh, get as much of the juice and the, the good solids and everything out of the, out of the grape pack that you can. Uh, an easy siphon and a hose, and this is, the first kit I bought didn't have anything, it just had a hose, and you stuck it in and sucked on it. It's kind of tough. This is kind of a snap. You put it on here, you lift it like that, push it down, and it's siphoned. Just as easy as that, so you just put it down in. It has a tip on the end that allows it to either suck all the way from the bottom, or if, you're, if you've got sediment in the bottom, which you do have at different times, then you put the sediment tip on it, but it doesn't pick up the sediment off the bottom, you put it off the bottom. Okay, a fill tip, and this is what we use for actually bottling, and this goes down in the wine bottle, and when the button is pushed, the wine comes out, flows, once, it, once you get to the top, you lift it up, it stops. It goes down and stops it. And you fill it up and you want to get on a wine bottle, same thing, within about an inch of the cork. Bottle brushes to clean your bottles. Carboy brush to clean carboy, because it's curved on the sides. And this is a corker. I use a I use a four corker, which is a little easier, but I'm getting the old. And it takes a lot of pressure on this one. The ladies have a little bit of a hard time, but the men will. You stand on top of it, and it plunges the cork down into the bottle. The nice thing about the, these are $21. The nice thing about the other one is it's 85 but you can sit in a chair with one hand. You can cork them all day long. So it's kind of nice. Okay, I think that's all the equipment. And what kind of questions are there? Um, when you're storing the wine, is there a temperature range that it needs to be? Well, think about it. Do the grocery stores have a temperature range? Do they have a cooler? Most of the time, it sits on a shelf. If it's if you use the right chemicals in it. We add very little sulfite. Okay, Sulfites will preserve the wine. And that's what most of the commercial wines have. In. They have a higher content of sulfites, which will allow it to last longer because they don't date it. It's not cold dated or anything else in the store. It's not stored properly. It's stored cork out, you know. If you store it on a side or upside down, the corks will stay wet. It'll last a lot longer. Can it be too cold? Uh, that could be a, I'm just wondering. Too cold is not a problem. Uh, you can take wine down to 
right below freezing temperature without without any problem at all. While you, while it's being made. I made I made wine last year in, a, in an oak barrel on my patio, and it stayed in there until March, and it sat on the patio the whole time. I dropped it down about that far so that if it did freeze, it'd have room to expand inside the oak barrel, not bust the barrel. But uh, no, it's, it's fine. Matter of fact. Next Thursday night is the last wine walk of the year here in town, and I'll be serving my home wines down here. So if you all want to come down and do the wine walk, you could uh, have a chance to taste it and see what it tastes like. Her so question was about storing the wine yeah. once it's bottled. <laughs> well, um, that's What's that? Any, any kind of well, in it's the it's bottle, you mean? Or? I was just trying to uh, differentiate between the fermenting process which requires the fermenting process <coughs> requires temperature. Okay. Yeah. okay. I want it between sixty five and eighty degrees. Uh, okay. okay. That, While it's good. fermenting. After it's done that first week, temperature is not a problem. It's it's the yeast that has a temperature problem. If yeast gets too hot it'll cook off. If it gets too cold, it'll it'll quit work. So you want to keep it between 65 and 85. Usually, commercial wines they'll they'll ferment the reds at closer to 80, 85. They'll they'll, they'll do the whites, which takes a little longer. They'll do those lots of times at 60, 65. You use the term cook off. What do you, what do you mean by that? It, it <clears throat> cooks it away. It it just eats up all the yeast. And I made you would that. have no yeast. <clears throat> I made apple wine one year, and uh, the carboy with the, uh, the trap on it still um, I got all kinds of okay. overflow. It was because it was still in its active fermentation stage. Okay. It should have been in the, in the bucket. It should have been in a bucket. Uh, and if you're checking it with a hydrometer, like I said, once you once it gets down to just about one, then it's, it's not going to be fermenting or bubbling. Or, I mean, you'll get a little bit of bubbles in it, but not enough to make it go over or anything. So that's that's one of the reasons why you start out in a loose fitting. It's giving you more oxygen and also has, it'll expand. Yeah, you'll get a foam cap on it about that big in this bucket while it's in that week. And while you have it in that bucket, there really isn't anything that you have to worry about when you have it in the, in the plastic bucket and the foam is starting to come up, is there anything that you should be doing? No, you have to stir it every day. You stir it. You want to stir it every day and that's primarily on this particular kit. And if you if you buy kits, if you buy from me, that's great. I appreciate the business and, and you keep it local. But if you buy it off the internet or anywhere else, uh, just be sure and and uh, follow the directions on the kit because they're all different. And the reason why I suggest to people to start making wine from a kit is because it's engineered, okay? They've, they've taken the guesswork out of it. Uh, it's engineered. If you follow the instructions, you're gonna end up with a good product. I may, I've won ribbons off of these kits two years in a row at the State Fair, won golds, both years, and I run a silver and a bronze. And unfortunately, we don't have to stay fair anymore, but uh, but it makes very, very good wine. The wine I'm using here today, because I'm going to take it home and make it, uh, is Amarone. Amarone, I was talking earlier about it. Amarone, if you go down and try and buy a bottle of it, first of all, you couldn't find a bottle at Gardenville probably couldn't find a bottle in Reno. It's about $65, $75 a bottle, okay? I've seen it as cheap on the internet as 39 That was the cheapest I saw any of it. If you've got your own equipment, you can make that for three bucks a bottle. $110 a bottle, three and a half. $110 for a kit of 30. Do you have to use cell phones? Do you have to use cell phones Sulfites? Sulfites? Yes. We uh, you don't have to. Uh, they recommend that you do. We're in kits over what they're doing in the store. 
is about one fourth the amount of sulfites. And people that sulfites bother that it bothers them if they do it and even add the sulfites that they tell you, in most cases it won't bother you at all. My wife didn't used to be able to like she doesn't like red wine that you buy at the store. You buy a thirty dollar bottle of wine, she didn't care. If it was red, she didn't like it. She didn't like it because it gave her headaches. I started making wine and now she won't she doesn't like white anymore. She likes our red, so as long as I as long as I uh, do it. And I've made it without sulfites. The thing is you're you're taking a chance if you're gonna if you're gonna age it anything over or hang on to it anything over uh, say six months, nine months. If you're gonna drink it faster than that, you don't have to add the sulfites. So what are the foreseeable problems? I mean, what are some of the, the uh, catastrophes? I mean, what are some of the bad batches that, that well, could happen? With kids, I haven't had any, okay? Uh, when I've made wine that I've made from scratch, I've, I've had some wines that didn't turn out that good. And part of it is uh, there's different yeast that you can use, and the yeast, it, They'll taste different, and they'll they'll change the flavor of it. And so, learning what yeast you want to use for what wine makes a big difference. He's making apple wine. There's a couple of yeasts that are very good for that type of uh, that type of fermentation over grapes. Uh, same thing, at alcohol content. If you're making something that is uh, made. Uh, one I just recently made that I'm going to enter in the competition on Tom Ridge is uh, chocolate raspberry pork, which has got some real advantages. It's 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 a high it's fortified for one thing, the brandy, but it, it's uh, it's a high alcohol content, so you've got to use a different yeast because otherwise the yeast will burn off. <laughs> Same thing because because you're cooking it too hot. It's it's you know, it's going too good if it's if it's a low a low uh, yeast one. It'll tell you that it's usually good up to about 14, <clears throat> and if you make them port, you're going to end up with about 18. So you know, you want something that will go, and there's a yeast that will go all the way up to like 22. So you know, percent alcohol. So you know, it's it you just got to do that right. Uh, temperature could be a problem. Uh, I was lucky last year, and, and like I said, we hit it on a patio and got down to pretty cold. Not as cold as we have been here lots of times, but it got pretty cold, and it made it. It turned out pretty good. Matter of fact, I'll be serving that red wine Thursday night down there. I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> did anybody <laughs> not get one of these? <laughs> you didn't, I know, because you just came here so much. Back there, did you get one of these? <clears throat> oh, you're <laughs> there. How much space do you actually need? How much yeast? How much space? Space. How much area? Big enough for, well, this is all the equipment that you're going to need. Okay. Uh, you're going to need space to either have this out or this out because that's what it's going to be in one of the two of those. And, and you need a table high height in order to be able to get it up so you can siphon off. You can't siphon. You can't siphon from here to here. It won't work. I cheated. I've got a hydraulic lift that I put it on and jack it up, and it comes up to table height. It works a whole lot easier that way, but it cost a hundred bucks too. Um, <clears throat> I noticed that the kit didn't have any sugar. No. Is that all added into the? Yes. Yeah. With with grapes, you don't need sugar. Uh, grapes, if they're if they're grown properly and at the right uh, level when they're picked, have enough sugar that they're going to give you a, a an alcohol content of probably 12 to 14 uh, percent. If they're picked too soon, then you might need to add sugar. Or if you wanted to make the alcohol content higher, and really, which is silly, a lot of people say, "Well, gee, I want to make it." really strong and good. Yeah, but it doesn't necessarily, because it's got more alcohol, doesn't make it taste better. It really doesn't. Matter of fact, sometimes if it's got more alcohol, it makes it taste worse. 
So, you know, you, you lose some of the fruitiness and, and the goodness that's in, in the grapes. And you, believe me, I was no wine connoisseur when I started this, and I'm, I'm not now. But you learn to enjoy certain tastes that you can develop and that you'll taste from these and you'll be able to taste it rather than have it hidden by oak. Things like that. So it's, it's a it's a fresher wine. Have you tried making any kind of apple wine? I've got one gentleman that, uh, that I'm going in partners with, matter of fact, this fall, um, some California wine that makes a lot of apple wine. I've never made apple. I've made garlic wine. I've made jalapeno wine. I've made basil wine. Those are all cooking. <coughs> all great wines for sautéing and for cooking. Uh, I've made uh, raspberry wine. That's the other one I'll be serving down there Thursday night. I make that from a, from a puree. And that one you add sugar to. What about wine? Have you tried that? No, I haven't. No. But, I, but you can make wine from basically anything. If it doesn't have enough sugar, when you take your hygrometer reading, you just you keep adding a sugar-water combination until you bring it up to the level that you're looking for. And that's that's the only real trick to making, you know, like I say, apple. Uh, uh, Nate's made apple, he's made banana, he's made, he's made a lot of different fruit wines. I, I'm finally getting him so he wants to make some grape wines, so we're going to we're going to go together. And, um, we went down to Delegato's last year in, in Lodi, and that's where I got the uh, a barrel full of, they, they actually have a two weekend span and, where they sell the juice, just the juice, and they pump it with a gasoline pump. And you take your own container, and like I was saying, it ends up costing like a buck a bottle. 365 a gallon for the juice, and then you got your chemicals in that. So, you know, you can do it that way. Yes, sir. Does it matter if it stays in the glass jug more than five weeks? No, no. So it can age it can in that stay, for... it can, Once it's in this, it's the same as being in a wine bottle. Okay, it has very little oxygen that can get to it. One thing I do do. With white wines, I don't cover it. With red wines, we should cover it. And that's why red wines are never bottled in a clear bottle. They're always bottled in a green bottle or an amber bottle because reds will fade. And if they fade, they get kind of ugly looking yellow color. <laughs> and, and changes the taste also. But they'll get almost this color. If it, if it fades out. So if I'm going to keep it in there, or even when I make red wine in the store, I tell you, bring a t-shirt, an old t-shirt, throw a t-shirt over the top of it, just protect it from the sun. But it could stay in there for six months, eight months. And then, then you can bottle it. Yep. Yeah. And then you're still going to get bottle track. Right. <laughs> you're going to get bottle track because it's going to get exposed to the oxygen. It's going to get disturbed. How long does the bottle shot? Yep. Take to, for it, to it, it tastes it sharp. It. It's a sharp taste to it. So after you bottle it, you should let it sit for a You let it sit for months. two weeks, a month. Okay. Yeah, and it'll, it'll go away. So while sitting in the uh, large airtight container, uh, do you have to keep monitoring the temperature on that as well? No, no. You don't have to monitor the temperature at all once it's in this, once it's in this. Um, that's after the first, that's what I'm saying, week to 10 days. And, and that depends upon the type of wine that you're making. Uh, fruit wines usually traditionally take a little bit longer to, to get out of that fermentation, get down to the one level where they're dry. And you can stop the fermentation while it's still got some sweetness in it, okay? And that's the way ports are made and that. And, but it's, it's really tricky. For a wine, for a home winemaker, the best way to do it is to ferment it all the way down below zero, as dry as it can be, and then if you want sweeter, then add sweetness back into it, uh, because then you can 
for one thing, you can hit the right spot. I mean, you just keep tasting and, and adding a little bit back in. Uh, if you stop the fermentation, you're stuck with what it, what it's at. You know, I mean, you can't can't adjust at that point. <clears throat> what do you call that little airlock device on the top? An airlock. Airlock. Um, <laughs> airlock in <clears throat> the bunk. <clears throat> Excuse me. During the fermentation process, that hiccups up and down, right? No. As well, the air escapes. No. During the fermentation, it's in here. Okay. But once it's once once you put it in the carboy and you and you top you put that top on. Don't you get some activity? Oh, you'll get you'll get some, yeah, and it'll bubble and and it'll come up come up through, but very little at that point. Once you're down to one, uh, it's not going to it's not going to bubble. So that you really got to go by the hydrometer. Yeah. Oh yeah. Strictly by the. <coughs> I, I got the impression that you can kind of taste it at various stages to see how you're oh, doing. Oh yeah, it. you you should taste it at various stages. Okay. Uh, we're going to add into it. At one point, just before we get ready to bottle, about a week before we get ready to bottle, we're going to add a clarifying agent in, which will take and draw, you know, pull all the the fog out of it and, and make it nice and clear. And that's what that's one of the things you shoot for when you're making wine. Uh, that also changes, improves the flavor. You can filter the wine when you bottle, but if you filter it. Uh, my own, I, and I shouldn't, I sell filters down there, but if that's what you want to do, my opinion is it changes the taste of the wine, and I don't, I don't enjoy it that much. I think it, it's better off not filtering. Cold filtration, one thing is you can do the same thing by getting it extremely cold, and that's what you'll find if you take a bottle of wine that you buy commercially and you stick it in the fridge, and you go back in two or three days, you'll see sediment in the bottom of it. And that's because the cold will suck that, suck that stuff right down to the bottom. And then you can siphon off, you know. That's what's, you know, one, one way of doing it. And so that was when I made it on the patio last year. I thought, you know, had that going for me because it got good and cold out there and, and it settled down in the bottom of the barrel. Okay. I hope I see you guys Thursday. And uh, anybody want to, when you, when you do this, you have to come four times uh, over a five week period or longer. The first time is rather critical. And the reason why the first time is critical, you want once it's reached one, you want to get it off of the yeast leaves, called the leaves, the subtle so it's in the bottom. You want to get it off of those. So, you know, it's done its primary fermentation, it's done its job, now it's going to leave that behind and go on. You want to do that right away. You don't want to leave it sit on those. That'll change the flavor of the wine. So you want to get it off. Then after that, if it goes a week longer or something, it's no big deal. But they give you they give you basics in the uh, in the instructions that you know, you wait so many, you wait a week to do this, a week to 10 days, you wait another week to 10 days after that and do the next step. And then you, you know, you, you go through all the steps and you add your, your final uh, sulfites and that kind of thing uh, just before you get ready to bottle and then you siphon from here. You'll have sediment from the bottom. You siphon from there into here, leave the sediment in here and then you can siphon all the way, pull the tip off all the way and go into, your, go into the bottles. But you, so you've actually had, you've shown it, the wine quite a bit of oxygen, which is where your bottle shop is coming from. Uh, anyway, like, yeah, you can, you can wait, you can wait three months, four months. The last one that I did with a gal down the store was she was gone for two months and came back and we bought one and it turned out to be fine. Archie, do you sell this kit here with that grape type? Yeah. At your store? Yeah. Yeah, I, that happens to be the only one but, that I have right now. But I can get anything I want, I can get within two, three days. So, yeah, I, I, and I try and keep my prices as close to what it would cost you if you bought it off. There's some big retailers that 
that sell on the internet. Mm -hmm. And uh, for a good quality, there are basically four companies that make a good quality. They all come from Canada. <laughs> uh, and that make good quality kits. Uh, I prefer this one because it does come with a, with a great pack. And I think that adds a lot to the flavor and, it, and enhances the enhances the wine. And I this one, if you were to buy it online, you might buy it for ten or fifteen dollars cheaper. But by the time you paid UPS and shipped it, it cost you another twenty five. So you know, there's there's uh, we try and keep as much in line as we can. So do you sell all the equipment? As well? Yes. Yeah. If you were to buy all the equipment, you could buy it as cheap as like a hundred dollars. Uh, carboys are forty-five right there, so I mean you get, you know, but you could buy it as cheap as about forty-five. But if you want, I mean a uh, hundred. But if you wanted the, the kit that I put together when I was teaching the class over here was about one hundred sixty dollars. Uh, so I mean you know you can. You can go one way or you can go the other. But uh, the, the nice thing about doing doing it with me, it costs you 25 bucks. Um, but you rent the equipment. If you find out you don't like to do it or don't want to do it again, you know, you're only out 25 bucks, you're not out 160. Yeah, I was just curious because I wanted to maybe give a gift to my mom. She's been interested for a while, but she lives up in Kirkwood, so just to drive down there that many yeah, times. Yeah, yeah. The concert. Yeah, no, we can well, we could put to, we could put together a, and she could she could learn to do it herself uh, from the instructions I did. Uh, and the people that I teach, if you, you know, the advantage to having somebody that's done it before is you can answer the little questions. The other the other piece of equipment that I don't show you here that I use, they also have you degassing the wine at some point. And that's to get the get the gas out of it that that will hang up in the wine. And on the instructions of the kit, it'll tell you vigorously stir it for two or three minutes, and then go back 20 minutes later and vigorously stir it for two or three minutes until you get all the bubbles out. Well, I also found out through one of my groups that if you take a brake bleeding tool that you can buy at Harbor Freight for 19.95. You put it, it fits exactly in the bum, the same as this does. You put it in there and you suck the vacuum to it and it pulls the gas right out of the line. And once you get from a little tiny bubble, like the size of a, the lead of a pencil, once it starts getting to a bigger bubble, like, this, like an eraser of a pencil, then you've got all the gas out. At that point, what you're doing actually is boiling the wine at room temperature, it's boiling, and that's because it's under under so much pressure. It doesn't hurt it any. It doesn't change the flavor of anything. If you cooked it, it would hurt it, but you know, you're not getting the temperature up, so it's not doing anything to it. Other than the wine walk, do you have samples of it at any other time? Do I? Like the different types of kits other than wine walk? So like if you're interested in doing it, but you're not sure which flavor of kit you want to do? Only what I've got, personally, okay. and I don't, I have very few whites. <coughs> yeah, uh, I like whites, I I have very few whites, and I don't usually have more than two or three different. Do you have favorites from like this listing of what you had here? Do you have favorites of these kits? Which ones are your favorites? Nah. I like, I like, well, I like the Amarone. <laughs> Amarone is, I like all reds. Amarone is probably the best value. Yeah. Okay. Because if, if you were to go buy that one, it would cost you a whole lot more. Yeah. Uh, but the uh, Barbera is a, is a nice light wine. That's a, that's a good wine. Merlot is, a, is another, is one of the heavier wines. And that's a pretty good one. And that'll, that'll, you could hold that one up against any Merlot that you California that you buy. Uh, Pinot Noir is a, a light wine also, and that one's pretty good. I like that too. Uh, the Argentine Malbec, Malbec, I, I'm not real crazy about it, so I've never made it. It's pretty, it's usually pretty heavy. Uh, 
The Syrah, same thing. I've never, I haven't used that one either. Cabernet I've used, and the Campanile I've used. And so I, you know, like right now I've got at home. Uh, I'm going to have Amarone in five weeks, but I think I've got Barbera and uh, Pinot. Huh. Okay. You know, so sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. It just depends on where I'm at, <laughs> what I've been making. So when does your tasting room open up? What, what are the hours of your tasting room? <laughs> on, on Thursday night? <laughs> no, Thursday night, it'll be 4.30 to 8, I think it is. 4.30 to 7.30 or something? I don't know. Anyway, there's, there's 38 or 39 places downtown that you can taste wine, so that's pretty good. <laughs> Pretty you can't deal. sell your wine that you made, correct, no. Archie? No, you can't. You can't. You, cover uh, that or? you can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> if, if we were in California, I could almost, I could, I could afford to be able to sell. Oh really? Yeah. I mean, that's why you go to California now and you drive down the road. There's a winery every other stop, you know. Yeah. Because they make most of them don't even grow their own grapes. Uh. They're making wine just like I'm making it, bottling it, putting a label on it, uh -huh. selling it at their own location. Yeah. They don't distribute it. They don't do anything. Just that one size. Yep. But, you know, Nevada, we can't do that yet. Yeah. Well, Archie, thank you very much. <laughs>